Hello and welcome to Cool Time Life. I'm your host, Steve Prentice. Here's what you need to know about this podcast series. Each of our Cool Time Life podcasts focuses on a topic dealing with people, productivity, and technology, and each offers ideas and facts you need to know about to thrive in today's busy world. An index of our podcasts and who I am, as well as subscription information, is available at steveprentice.com under the podcast tab. Just a couple of days ago, I received a text from my 75-year-old mother. It literally read as follows. I just received a message from Netflix saying an error had occurred during my last payment. Please verify you payment method by following this link. I followed the link, but it is asking for information regarding my credit card. Do you think this is a scam? End quote. She followed up with a second text where she highlighted the fact that she had noticed the grammatical error of you instead of your. Of course, I texted her back immediately and told her this was a scam. You didn't click on anything, did you? I asked. Yes, she replied, but I only entered my email address and password. Was that okay? And so I spent the next hour on the phone showing her how to change her Netflix password and admonishing her once again about the danger of clicking on these types of messages. So why does this continue to happen? Why are people still being seduced by stories of millions of dollars belonging to a Nigerian prince that needs to be parked in your bank account? Why do people click on badly written notifications of frozen bank accounts, missed courier shipments, or job applications? Why is the most common password in use still password123? It's because criminals are getting progressively more sophisticated, while honest people generally are not. Bad guys relentlessly focus on devising new ways to steal. That's their primary occupation in many cases. But ordinary people have other pressing matters to attend to. Emails, meetings, groceries, the kids. Phishing is a distraction crime, and people have too many things occupying their minds. It's still easy for phishing emails to slip through no matter how badly they are spelled. In the case of my mother, there is also the notion of trust. She comes from a generation in which there was some degree of trust based on a common and more localized culture. In the 1960s and 70s, before voicemail and robocalls, it was likely that anyone who called your home phone had a direct relationship with you. To answer it was a common courtesy, and that's a habit that is now exploited by scammers every day and is very difficult for people to give up. Some phone scammers don't even need you to answer the phone. Do you get mysterious hang-up calls from distant countries like Albania or Chad? These calls are intended to get you to call back, curious as to who the caller might be, and as soon as you do, an elaborate long-distance chargeback scam kicks in. Online, the key issue is data. Hackers will do anything to get in because once they do, they have access to data of all types. Lots of end users dismiss the threat or go blissfully unaware that a threat even exists. So let's look at both of those for a moment. First, dismissing the threat. My company or department is too small to get hacked, you might say. Or I'm just a junior employee. I don't have anything of value. There appears to be no motivation to get strict on password management or cyber hygiene when the stakes seem so low. But they are not low. They are incredibly high. Every company and person is connected to every other company and person through the Internet. As a criminal, I could easily pair up a common password, like password123, with low-tech approaches such as researching your mother's maiden name on Facebook to correctly answer a challenge question. If I was more sophisticated, I could use more brute force attacks like credential stuffing to overwhelm a company's IT defenses. Software-based attacks often take place once something has been allowed into the system through a phishing email or an infected USB drive. Every additional piece of data that an organization can collect from you, like a home address here, a challenge question there, a medical record, all these pull together to form a stronger and stronger collection of pieces of data about you and also about people connected to you, which is basically anyone and everyone. A password that you used on different accounts a couple of years ago might mean nothing to your busy, distracted mind, but data is data. Someone out there is busy hammering away at your accounts with every piece of data about you that they have been able to obtain. And just like inheriting a collection of unlabeled door keys, if you try every one of them, the odds are one will eventually connect. Complacency, ignorance, optimism. These are all dangerous things to have when all of your security is at stake. Even though you personally are obviously not a hospital or nuclear power plant, a simple infected document inadvertently sent to, let's say, an HVAC contractor, a contract for some work at your house, for example, can easily infect the contractor's own systems. 
Now, if this contractor's next job is working on the HVAC system at a nuclear power plant, the infection propagates. Yes, these large places have extensive IT and cybersecurity resources, but it's always a cat and mouse game, as frequent data breach stories in the news will attest. So when was the last time you changed the password on your home Wi-Fi router? Do you know how much your home assistant software, your phone or your new big screen TV are listening to you? Do you know how easy it is for hackers to gain access to your new smart doorbell or nanny cam? Not only to steal data, but to listen in and in some cases communicate with family members. So what brand of password manager are you using? Most people will look blankly at you when you ask them that question. To me, that's like someone saying, what's Ebola? Basically, as the expression goes, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. And yes, Ebola can happen anywhere. Much of this is eminently preventable. Criminals might be everywhere, but they are also generally very lazy. They want the easiest way to break into something, and basically, you are it. One of the easiest ways to secure your life is to ensure the sanctity of your passwords by using two strong tools, a password manager and two-factor authentication. A password manager is a software app like LastPass or Sticky Password that generates passwords for you. These passwords are long strings of characters, numbers, and symbols that you could not possibly memorize and bad actors could not possibly guess. Every time you log on to a website that requires a logon, the app will help you generate a password or replace the existing one. It will never create duplicates. Where do these passwords get stored? Well, not on your computer and not on the servers at the app itself. They're not even stored in transit on the wires of the Internet. The password only reappears when you, as a logged-in user of the password, go and visit a page where that password is needed. The password manager sends an encrypted message to an encrypted file on your computer, and only then will the actual password reconstitute itself from its encrypted state. It's a little like alchemy, and is more involved than the way I've just described it here, except to confirm that your passwords do not actually get stored in whole anywhere. They get scrambled, like scrambled eggs, and will only reappear and unscramble when your circumstances permit it. The point here, as with much of what I write and speak about, is that the technology and techniques for effective cybersecurity do exist, but it's people that get in the way. Yes, it's a hassle having to change your password every two weeks, but there's a reason why this has to happen, and an app like LastPass makes it easy and effortless and much more secure. The same applies to two-factor authentication, or even multi-factor authentication. This technique is becoming just as vital as password management software since it broadens your defenses by an order of magnitude. In short, two-factor authentication, called 2FA for short, requires a second password sent to a second physical device that only you have. In most cases, currently, that's your phone. Whenever you are given the opportunity to use 2FA, do take it. Yes, the few seconds of delay required waiting for the passcode to appear on your phone is worth it. It's like putting a deadbolt on your door. So why is cyber hygiene so hard? Cyber hygiene is hard because it demands two things of us, time and comprehension. In an age of instant satisfaction, a delay of mere seconds can be enough to make an online consumer abandon a shopping cart or happily ignore the warnings and logons to public Wi-Fi, which means they go on unprotected. Or they click on accept to every cookie's warning that every website now presents. I mean, have you ever read the terms of those things? Of course not. Secondly, learning how to create secure passwords presents a perceptual barrier. It appears difficult, so it is passed by. It is easy to assume that as an individual, you are too small, too insignificant to be of interest to a cyber criminal, but you would be wrong on those counts. Firstly, your personal data, including name, address, social security number, and everything else, can be used by thieves to open credit card accounts, buy houses, or create fake identities to be used in an infinite number of ways. And second, you, I, and everyone else is connected to everyone else in a global game of six degrees of separation, meaning we all become conduits to security breaches and crime, even at the largest and highest levels. If you want to boil it down to a couple of simple rules, I propose these. Number one, do use a password manager for everything that you connect to, including home devices. Number two, never answer the phone unless you know who it is. Phone scammers need you to answer. Number three, never click on any link that comes to you through email, even if it looks legitimate. If it is something that might be a real transaction, go to that source directly. 
log into your account through the website and password you have on hand, but never through the email itself. And four, when you are traveling outside, use a VPN, a virtual private network, which is a piece of software that opens up once you start to log on to a public Wi-Fi system and creates a tunnel that disguises your presence and therefore makes it very, very difficult for other people on that same shared public Wi-Fi to snoop on your computer. Cyber hygiene is both a learned physical skill and a mindset, and both are vital to your existence, both online and offline. Just like stopping to get gas for your car, it's something you have to do in order to actually keep going. So, that's my little podcast on cyber hygiene and getting over the difficulty barrier. If you have a comment about the show or a question you'd like answered in a future episode, please do let me know. You can drop me a line through the contact form at steveprentice.com and you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen Prentice, S-T-E-V-E-N-P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E. And on LinkedIn, just search for Cool Time Life. No spaces, just as one word. And if you like what you hear, please do subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. The theme music for Cool Time Life was obtained through podcastthemes.com. And until next time, I'm Steve Prentice. Stay safe and thanks for listening.